going to do the usual format again. Uh, Kieran and I will share the slides. I'm going to talk through the domestic economy, uh, through to the trade, and then Kieran will talk about uh, labour market, uh, public finances, and the general assessment. So I guess the position we're in uh, as of Q3 2021 gives a, certainly a little bit more clear in terms of the economic outlook than we had uh, prior to this. Um, obviously, the, the very successful role of the vaccination program and the unwinding of the public health measures provide a little bit more certain economic climate uh, going, going into the end of this year and into next year than, than we have certainly had to, to date. So we, we, in, in our discussions around our, uh, the, the, the commentary, putting the commentary together, we, we certainly felt it was a little bit of a different position we're in now relative to, to, to most of the commentaries uh, since uh, March 2020, where there has been a huge amount of uncertainty about the potential for public health restrictions going forward. While that's probably not, uh, but that's a risk that, that always remains, I think, in, in the pandemic context, uh, certainly the, the outlook does look a little bit more uh, certain in, in those terms than, than we have uh, previously. Uh, given that, uh, the, the Irish economy is expected to grow very rapidly this year. And that there's two components of that. There's obviously the, the multinational component, which gives rise to the headline uh, forecast, which we're, we're coming in at just under 13% for this year and, uh, and, and strong growth into next year. But then there's also the domestic component uh, for this year, which we'll talk through. We, we, we see that uh, growing quite rapidly uh, this year, even, even in, the, in the context of the public health measures that were in place earlier in the year. So certainly a, a normalization of economic activity uh, is coming back. We, we see that we'll be back to near normal activity by the end of the year, in line with the, 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 the unwinding of the continued public health measures. And uh, in line with that, we anticipate quite a rapid uh, rebound and also quite a, a marked reduction in the unemployment rate, dropping down towards, towards single figures uh, at the end of this year. And the, the charts we have here in the overview uh, juxtaposes Ireland with the, the, the EU context. And I think the, the, the remarkable performance of the Irish economy uh, or should I say extraordinary performance of the Irish economy uh, last year and this year contrasts quite strongly uh, with, 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 with the, our European peers and other Western economy peers. And, and that's mainly due to the, the activities of the export sector, in particular in the multinational sector, which we will, we will talk uh, through in the slide back and see is, is, is well known to, to everybody here. Okay, so, so in terms of the, the headline figures, uh, if we if we focus in on the, the 2021 column here, you know, we see a consumer expenditure uh, rebounding strongly this year with growth at 7.5% uh, on an annualized basis in, in consumption. That, that's a, a really strong rebound. We, we see, uh, we can see uh, the, the, uh, there was a dip down in the, in the first quarter of this year as the public health restrictions uh, were, were in place, but then that has kicked on in the second quarter and we expect it to, to continue to grow strongly uh, through the end of this year uh, and, and into next year. Obviously public expenditure has, has, has come in and, and, and uh, kicked in where the private sector dropped out last year and we expect strong consumer expenditure this year and, and then uh, we, we move into the, the investment story. So there's obviously we, we're, our headline investment uh, is a fall a very sharp fall in investment, but that's what's happening there is that there was a, a, a big increase in, in at the start of 2020 from the multinational activity. And this has just come down from coming down from that. So that's why we're seeing this, this fallback. So, so this isn't uh, relating to any of the underlying activity in the domestic economy. This is just uh, multinational trends. I think one of the key factors that we, we had pointed out in the previous commentary and, and, and carrying through into this one was that the, the, the export channel was growing very, very rapidly. We're forecasting 14% export growth for, for this year. That comes on, on the back of a very strong export performance last year, uh, which kind of really outperformed uh, the, 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 the pandemic related effects uh, that, that we had seen uh, the domestic economy really gave us that growth through the export channel last year. We see that really, really continuing. Uh, this year, imports are, are you know are down 
Uh, this year, uh, and that's related to the multinational investment activity, obviously this capital is imported and, and uh, when we see the, the investment uh, come down, then imports are, are going to come down uh, on the back of that. And this all leads us to a headline GDP figure just under uh, 13%. Now, when we, obviously the, the, the key uh, issues around GDP as a metric for Ireland are, are still theirs. And, and if we look at, at the modified domestic, domestic demand figure, which is the bottom figure in, in, the, in the first set of results here, it's a much more uh, muted growth. It's very high growth rate, but it's, it's, it's certainly not double digits. And our growth rate there is at 7.1%, uh, which takes into account our view that we're going to get quite a rapid re recovery in consumption. And we feel investment is going to kick up, uh, underlying investment is going to kick up for, for towards the end of this year. So all of that's going to lead to, to, to very strong recovering domestic economy. So we're talking about 7.1% growth uh, there for, for this year. <clears throat> in, into next year, uh, if, we, if we focus in on, on consumption, again, uh, we, we, we see uh, consumer expenditure growing rapidly next year. Obviously, the, the big feature of the pandemic, which we'll talk about in a second, has been the recovery or, or the, the increase in the savings ratio. So households have been accumulating, on average, they've been accumulating quite considerable savings. And with a continued unwinding of public health measures and renormalization of economic activity and the possibility of unwinding those savings uh, balances, we see, see quite rapid growth uh, in consumption for next year. Uh, on the back of that, we see a kind of a, a reduction in the growth rate of public uh, consumption, so public uh, current expenditure. We see that there, there will be a step back with some of the pandemic supports if the economy renormalizes and that will allow a reduction in the growth rate of public expenditure. We see investment uh, growing next year uh, quite rapidly, obviously uh, with a more certain climate that should lead uh, to, to a more normalized investment framework and, and we see investment kicking back uh, uh, next year. Now, obviously I want to point out when we forecast for 2022, what we're talking about here is the, the underlying investment component. Uh, when we're forecasting for 2022. Uh, we still see strong export growth uh, next year. Uh, so 9% so export growth next year. And we do see a rebound uh, in, in imports next year, both as consumption uh, increases and as, as investment uh, comes back. So next year, we're looking at GDP growth of, of about 7% uh, with, with domestic demand growth of about 7.2 for next year. Uh, if I move on to just a, a quick overview of, of the labour market and the, the public finances, um, the uh, unemployment rate for this year, uh, we're, we're forecasting a, a year average of, of 16%. But as I mentioned earlier, you know, that, that kind of belies where, where, where we're going with the trend because at the, at the early part of the year, the rate was very high because the restrictions were in place. Um, but we, you know, we see the rate tipping down just to under under into single digits towards the end of, of this year. So, so quite a rapid improvement towards the end of this year in, in the uh, labour market. And then uh, for next year, we, we're, we see a continued improvement in the labour market and the unemployment rate tipping down to, to just over, over 7%. Uh, Kieran will, will talk in detail about the public finances, but in terms of the general government balance, we see that about uh, just under 15 billion uh, deficit this year. 3.4% of GDP and the deficit coming down and next year to about 8 billion and, and just under 2% of GDP. I guess one of the, the features of the economy, uh, of the economic rebound, which we're putting a little, little bit more emphasis on this time is the inflationary environment. Uh, we, we see inflation picking up this year and into next year. I think there's, there's lots of different factors that we'll, we'll talk about in more detail on that. Obviously with the inflation environment we have, the, the international global factors, so the, the energy prices being one of the, the major catalysts, but also the supply chain difficulties that, that are occurring in the global economy. And then we've got the domestic factors. So obviously with a strong rebound in, in, in the economy and uh, with a targeting of the, of the consumption into those sort of non-traded activities, which, which were maybe uh, households were unable to undertake those expenditures during the period, uh, in which the, the public health restrictions were, were uh, 
in place, for example, in hotels, tourism, restaurants, those types of services, activities, uh, we see expenditure increasing in that, and that, that, that's likely to give rise to, to, to inflationary pressures uh, in the domestic economy. So I think the inflationary context is a little bit different now and setting is, is providing a different set of challenges maybe than we, we had earlier in the pandemic. And I think that's that's part of the changing context as we recover uh, from the, the, the kind of public health phase of this particular crisis. Okay, so let me let me talk a little bit more about uh, consumption. Uh, we see uh, strong consumption growth this year. We see it, see it kicking back in quite, quite strongly. You can see the, the chart on the uh, right-hand side here uh, documents Ireland uh, in the kind of solid blue line and then gives a range for other European countries, the, the median being the dashed green line. You can see uh, last year the falling consumption in Ireland was larger than other countries, but then the rebound has been sharper. So certainly we can see that that kickback this towards it, the, the second quarter of this year has been has been larger than, than other countries. So, so we, we we're seeing that rap, rapid recovery uh, in the domestic economy. I guess the, the, the big feature that we've documented and, and the, the big unknown with what happens is the savings that balances that, in, that have, have built up and, and the, the, the usage of these savings, what are households going to do with these? Um, one of the, the you, you'll see in the actual commentary document itself, there are the, if you draw on the European Commission's uh, consumer sentiment survey, they ask households, what, what are you planning to do with these savings? And, and two of the the features that are interesting from that is that Irish households appear to be much more likely to spend uh, on, to, on home improvements and home purchase than other European countries. And I think that's an important uh, indicator for what may happen if, if, if we're thinking about some of these savings balances. It's likely that, that they'll, they'll leak into the, the housing market, be it in housing investment in existing uh, dwellings or, or the purchase of, of new dwellings. Again, I think it's the, the change in the savings ratio in Ireland really has been quite, quite marked relative to, to other countries. You can see we had a lower savings ratio coming into the, the, the pandemic, and then it really has, has skyrocketed since then. So what happens to these savings really will determine uh, quite a, a considerable uh, part of the, of the path uh, for, for the domestic economy going forward. Uh, the investment picture again is 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 always very volatile. It's always very difficult to to to, to forecast. There's there's obviously two components here. There's the multinational activity, which uh, uh, really uh, drives the overall headline figure, and then there's there's the underlying uh, activity of Irish enterprises, which is which is which is more difficult to get a, a picture on, uh, given the, the headline figures. The the dramatic drop that we're forecasting this year is due to that big increase in. Uh, in, in the early part of 2020, which, which carries through to this year and then pulls down this year. Uh, and I think that's an important component to, to, to note. We're seeing, we're, we are forecasting uh, a, a strong rebound next year uh, in investment activities, and that's underlying investment. In terms of construction output, obviously that's a, a core component of the, of the, uh, the investment outlook. And we do see, uh, you know, obviously that there was, a drop in the first quarter of this year with the, the public health restrictions, but we do expect it to, to increase the we'll forecast about 21,000 housing completions for this year, and rising to 26,000 housing completions uh, for, for, for next year. I, I think it's one of the features which, which uh, we haven't documented in a huge degree since the, the, the pandemic, but, but one we wanted to, to focus on a little bit in this commentary was the, was the, the financial outlook. And um, you know, as, as would have naturally been expected, we did see a drop in lending and new lending uh, through the, the pandemic period. Um, in particular, SME credit uh, dropped. You know, there's obviously both supply and demand elements within the, the overall borrowing rate, our borrowing level that we can see there, but it was a fall in SME credit uh, quite marked in 2020 relative to, to 2019. Now that's you know, obviously driven by, by, by two things. Uh, there, there's likely to be uh, changes on the demand side. You know, firms are not likely to be undertaking investment as, as to the extent that they have, they have had been before. That's going to lower the demand side, but also the, there will be change in risk profile of, of firms 
actually the pandemic and, and that's likely to lead through to, to the supply side. So, you know, one, one of the things we're, we're hoping to do towards the end of this year in our kind of research activities is to, to provide an update on, on the SME investment activity that we, we had previously done prior to the pandemic. So we have some new survey data come in for that. So we hopefully will provide uh, more information towards the end of this year or into early next year uh, on, on that side. Um, again, uh, the household level, household, household uh, borrowing, uh, you know, has come down, but we have seen, I don't have it here, but we have seen quite a mark pick back up in mortgage lending, or new mortgage lending towards, towards the more recent quarters, and I think that's important. Again, one of the, the interesting features, again, is that deposits are, are outstripping uh, total loans, so there's this, this funding surplus uh, on the bank's side, so that's, I think that's an interesting contra contrast. I think a, a feature that we've uh, pointed out on multiple occasions uh, in this commentary really is the, the, the high interest rates in Ireland that we're, we're continuing to see that through the pandemic period, even with the ultra low rates uh, from, from an ECB level, the, the interest rates, the lending interest rates in Ireland are higher than, than other uh, European economies. Um, I'll just talk quickly about the traded side before I hand over to Kieran. Obviously, the, the, the really uh, exceptional export performance we've seen last year and into this year uh, is why we're seeing the, the high growth, the double digit growth this year and the, the economic growth last year. And other European economies haven't seen this. Uh, for last year, we certainly saw that improved trading position with uh, some of our big real export markets, for example, the pharma activity and the computer service activity gave us quite a, a growth last year. Uh, this year, Little bit different. Some of that growth is coming from the, the kind of globalization factors that we've seen that the merchanting and the, 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 the contract manufacturing. So a little bit different in the composition of the growth this year, even though it is it is high. And I think that's worth uh, that's worth um, pointing out. You can see these these two charts here, chart the year and year growth in, in, in exports. Uh, on the top chart, you can see that the goods exports really have been uh, are growing very, very strongly since the pandemic period, uh, and the imports have kind of uh, uh, fell off last year uh, based on, on, on the changes in the, the importation of, of capital goods uh, and the like. So, that, so there's quite a volatile uh, import series. Well, one of the things we, we've tried to do in this commentary uh, is to uh, look at the difference between the performance of uh, the international trade uh, side and these kind of globalization factors. And what we've done in, in this particular chart here is in the, uh, in the kind of light purple bar here, we have uh, included uh, the international trades, so that's the, the goods uh, trade from the, 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 uh, the, the current account data and stripped out from that, the, the what we would class as these multinational activities. So from that is the, the globalization factors, the merchanting, the goods for processing, and the, uh, the more uh, FDI-oriented service activities, so the royalties, licensing, and the, the R&D and leasing activities, and looked at the difference in the growth rates between that group relative to the underlying activity. And you can see the a purple line is the growth rate in this international trade and, 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 and services activity. And you know that it has grown quite strongly into this year, but you can see the growth is much, much stronger and more volatile in, in a sense from this globalization activity. And that's really what's leading to the, the big growth rate uh, this year. Okay, finally, I'd, I'd just make a, a comment, obviously underlying all these, these trade stats is, is the changing relationship of, of, of the trade with the UK. It's very difficult when, when our, our, our overall traded picture is dominated by the multinational activity to treat, really see what's happening with Brexit, the UK trade, and, and with the, uh, the, the relationship between Irish firms and their, their, their traded activity. And furthermore, the pandemic is kind of complicating the, the kind of Brexit story, but obviously the, the, there is the, the change in the relationship, um, and, and there still is the continued imbalance in, in the customs checked. Uh, so it's difficult to, to, to really get a, a picture on what's going to happen overall. Uh, certainly we've seen a couple of trends uh, coming through. Imports from the UK to, to Ireland have declined, while uh, our 
you know, while, while our Irish exports have continued to grow in, in, in many, many categories, so that you can see this imbalance occurring. Um, in general, the, you know, obviously the, the, the change, uh, the, the transit and uh, transition relationship fell off at, at a period when the, uh, the, in the first quarter of this year, when the, the public health restrictions were brought back in. So the, there's, there's lots of confounding factors happening. Uh, in, uh, with this, but uh, we we have seen some some signs of recovery in the, in the second quarter. So a little bit early to, to see what's what's happening uh, overall there. Okay, I'm going to hand over to, to Kieran now to talk about the labour market, public finances, and assessment. Okay, so um, yeah, on the labour market side, obviously as Connor said, the, the the very strong pace of growth uh, clearly is having a positive effect in terms of the unemployment number coming down. So. In 2019, or 2020, sorry, the unemployment uh, rate was 19.4%. This year, we believe it's around 16, it'll be the average for the year will be 16.3%, and next year, down to 7%. By the end of 2022, uh, the unemployment rate will be just under uh, 6%, I think 5.9%. So uh, it's not quite back to where it was before the, um, the pandemic hit, but it is, you know, very quickly approaching that rate. And certainly, you know, towards the end of 2022, start of 2023, you can expect to see the unemployment rate come back uh, to, to where it was just before the, the pandemic hit. Um, obviously, um, the pandemic uh, unemployment payment has played a, a huge part in, um, uh, you know, insulating households from the worst impacts of the pandemic. Uh, there's obviously been changes uh, to the uh, pandemic payment in, in recent times, and it's obviously set to be tapered out uh, in the months ahead um, between September, November and February of 2022. Uh, and there also will be some uh, changes as far as the employment wage subsidy scheme is concerned, and, and, and both of those measures have been very important, uh, I suppose, again, in terms of insulating the, the, the labour market from the worst effects uh, of, and, and household incomes, most importantly, I suppose, from the worst effects of the, the, the changes due to the pandemic. Um, so you can see the, um, the scale of changes, I suppose, uh, 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 and the turbulence in the labour market over the last period of time. So you can see the unemployment rate here, the traditional monthly unemployment rate in blue. And then you can see uh, the payment, including the, uh, the pandemic uh, unemployment payment in red. And so you can see it reached a peak of 30, just under 32%. Uh, at the height, I suppose, of the public health measures um, in um, the uh, midpoint of 2020. Uh, you can see the, the uh, red figure again scaling up uh, at the start of the present year as public health measures were reintroduced because of the increase in the infection rate. And you can see how it's been tapering off uh, in the last couple of months, really, as the economy increasingly opens up and economic activity, particularly in the more domestic sources of the economy, is able to um, is able to take off again. You can see the numbers then of people uh, on the wage subsidy scheme. So you can see again at the peak in May uh, last year, you had over 600,000 people uh, in receipt of the wage subsidy schemes. Um, that's in the light blue line. The dark blue line are those people on the live leg register. And so again, you can see the numbers scaling up again in the early part of this year, again, because of the public health measures and then falling off uh, to the present point where they are uh, somewhere in the region of around 143,000. So again, you can see a very turbulent period, obviously, in the labor market because of the effects of, of COVID-19. Uh, the public finances are quite important, and, and we've done quite a bit of work in, in the present commentary looking at the public finances. Overall, I think, um, you know, the, the, the very quick pace of recovery, both in terms of the headline and the underlying growth in the economy, means that, you know, order, if you like, is being restored to the public finances in a much, arguably in a much quicker fashion than uh, was previously thought. So if you look at the headline indicators, um, the growth general government balance, um, our expectation is that this year that balance will be somewhere in the region of just under three and a half percent. So if you think of the three percent being the upper limit and the, the the kind of fiscal rules, you can see that you're quickly coming back towards that rate because of the very strong pace of recovery in, 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 in the economy and also because there hasn't been quite as much expenditure on COVID related measures in the present year. Uh, then was set out in the previous budget. So um, the expenditure levels are a little bit lower, but the tax revenues in particular are very, very strong, reflecting the very you know, accelerated and, and robust nature of the recovery uh, this year. 
Uh, similarly, next year, we believe, again, a continuation in the improvement, if you like, in the public finances. So we think the deficit next year will be just over one and a half percent, one point seven percent. And you can look at you can see then the effects on the headline debt to GDP ratio. We also include, obviously, the debt to GNI star. But you can see that, for instance, for example, the debt to GDP ratio will be down to just over uh, 50 or just under 52 percent by the end of 2022. Um, and that's actually down quite a bit on where it was uh, in 2019, just before the pandemic. Uh, the debt to GNI star ratio uh, will be down to pretty much where it was by the end of 2022, will be down to pretty much where it was in 2019 as well at around 95%. So you can see, as I said, much uh, you know quicker pace of recovery in the public finances than was previously thought. And again, that's mainly down to the very strong pace of recovery in the economy. And we see that then particularly as far as the revenues are concerned, obviously in the, ta in the, in the tax receipts. In the commentary, we do do an exercise where we look at the strong pace of, of recovery in the tax receipts this year. And we try and work out how much of that strong uh, performance is down to a rebound effect. So clearly you would expect to see a strong recovery in taxation headings this year because the economy is being opened up. But how much of that then is also down to the underlying uh, rate of growth in the economy. And I think it's 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 clear that there both elements are playing a part. So the very strong increase in taxation receipts. So for example, figures out just uh, on Monday show um, over a 16.5% increase in the total tax receipts for the period uh, to September this year compared to last year. Of that, it's clear that a certain element is the rebound effect, the, the very strong bounce back effect, but some element is also an underlying rate of growth in the economy. And I think that's, um, that, that's an important point, that the economy has continued to grow through the pandemic. Um, and that's been reflected in the tax receipts. So overall, then that's led to a you know quite a quite a quick recovery, really, in terms of the the headline uh, indicators. Um, in in a, another box in the commentary, we look at this issue, and we've heard quite a lot of commentary recently, I suppose, in light of the very you know the high levels of borrowing in the present year and in last year. We've heard kind of questions about Ireland or statements about Ireland being a high debt country, and so we we looked at that in a little bit more detail. And what we did is we, instead of, you know, there's obviously huge discussion around the appropriate indicator to use. Do you use debt to GDP or do you use debt to GNI star? Um, what we do in, in, in the box is we use another indicator, which is we look at the debt to the taxation receipts. So we think that that's uh, quite a useful measure to use. It's been used in an international context. I think it's quite useful to use. And we look at it in an Irish context um, over the last period of time and compare us to European countries. What we see is that uh, in 2019, which was the last date that there was historical data available, it's clear that Ireland, it's not quite at the, you know, we're, we're not quite up to where we'll say the, 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 the position in Greece uh, or in Italy or in Portugal, but it's clear that we're at the higher end of the spectrum as far as uh, most European countries are concerned. When you look at the ratio of our debt to taxation receipts. Uh, however, the key point, and I think this is often lost in some of the commentary around these kind of indicators is you have to look at the trend the, the, a snapshot at a point in time won't necessarily tell you a whole lot. What's the, the key kind of issue is how has that trend and how has that indicator been moving through time and where is it likely to move uh, over the coming years? And I think what's clear in an Irish context is that there's been a significant improvement in that ratio over the last seven or eight years. And that's due to the very strong improvement in economic conditions and the, and the strong pace of growth in the economy generally. So for example, if you look at the, the change in the ratio between 2011 and 2019, you can see that the Irish economy registered the strongest improvement in that ratio, i.e. it fell uh, from, I think it fell from 3.9 uh, in 2011 down to 2.6 uh, in 2019. So there was a 30% reduction in the ratio of the debt to the overall taxation. Uh, and that suggests that, you know, Ireland's position uh, the public finances position are in a, a, a much better position, arguably, than looking at it from a snapshot point in time. Also, we expect that ratio to come down quite a bit over the next two years in terms of the forecast period. And again, we've included estimates for that in the box. So it says that clearly th there's no great room for complacency. We obviously, our, our debt level is relatively high compared to other European countries. But over the next couple of years, we believe it'll return to a position of almost kind of in the average, if you like, across European countries. Um, so I, I think it's important to take that 
uh, 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 you know, in, into account when you're assessing our debt position in terms of, uh, and particularly, I suppose, in terms of the, the sustainability uh, of the recent kind of fiscal policy that we've been uh, adopting. Just on the inflation then, as I said, some of it is, is domestically orientated, clearly with the bounce back and, and the opening up of the economy. And then clearly some of it then is driven by global trends in terms of higher energy costs and gas prices, et cetera. Uh, and so our expectation is that uh, the in inflation rate will peak uh, sometime early uh, in 2022, but thereafter will uh, return towards a more normal long run trend by the end of 2022. Obviously, that's heavily conditional and conditioned on uh, developments in international energy markets uh, and how those are likely to play out over the next period of time. Uh, but overall, you can see our, our inflation rate, we're forecasting it at 2.3% in the present year. Uh, and then to increase to 2.5% next year. But again, that reflects the fact that it'll peak in the early part of next year before easing off towards the end of uh, 2022. Okay, Connor, if you can just move then maybe to the assessment. I'll just move straight on to the assessment, thanks. So uh, overall, very strong uh, uh, performance by the Irish economy, both domestic and foreign um, uh, economic activity, uh, contributing very substantially this year. Last year, obviously, was more the export activity. This year, we see strong contribution from domestic sources, obviously, with the economy uh, opening up. That's where uh, that element is coming from. Uh, modified domestic demand, which is a more accurate measure of how domestic sources or sectors of the economy are performing, set to increase by over 7% in 2021. The unemployment rate set to come down. Um, the relatively moderate decline in the savings ratio then prompting quite a, still prompting quite a pickup in consumption, both this year and next year. Um, and, you know, obviously in terms of the challenges, the inflationary issue is clearly one uh, going forward. And as I said, a lot will depend on how international energy markets perform over the next period of time in terms of what the domestic inflation rate is set to be. On the public finances, you know, clearly I think we've shown that there is quite a substantial improvement in the public finances, uh, quicker than probably what most people would have expected due to the strong pace of recovery. Um, but I think there is a crucial issue here in terms of how we manage public the fiscal policy going forward. We've outlined and argued for stronger levels, higher levels of investment in areas such as housing uh, and climate change and, and, and healthcare. So clearly the government, I think, is, is, is committed to increased investment in those areas. But given the very strong pace of recovery in the economy, it's important that we kind of, uh, you know, uh, avoid uh, the risks around overheating. So what that calls for is if we have increased capital expenditure, that we have to maintain a certain degree of discipline on the current expenditure side if we are to prevent the economy from overheating. The government is set to increase its expenditure quite significantly on the capital side in coming years. We believe the economy will continue to grow very strongly. And so as to avoid overheating, I think it's important uh, that there is significant discipline, uh, if you like, uh, demonstrated on the current expenditure side. And I think that'll be the key kind of fiscal policy challenge uh, going forward. 